Wyoming PBS is proud to produce interesting and compelling programs like the Farm to Fork Wyoming you are about to see. Your membership support makes it possible for us to bring you these programs, and it's fast and easy to do. Just click on the support button on your homepage and take it from there. You can become a member, renew your membership, or give an additional gift. Thank you, and enjoy the program. Hobby Beekeeping. On this farm to Fort Wyoming. Commercial beekeepers in Wyoming are known for the exceptional honey they produce. But we are also blessed with a growing population of hobby beekeepers selling their honey in the farmer's markets. Oh, that's, let's let them show the, show the behavior. <clears throat> They'll get down and they stick their tails in the air. They're, they're releasing scent. See this one with his back end raised and his wings fanning? They fan real fast. He's fanning scent. Say, what's happening guys? And we don't want that attack pheromone to come out. I have to smoke I, I can't think of another situation where you have such uh, contradictions to one another that it's so much fun and so beneficial, but it's so such hard work and all these challenges all the time. And you're doomed to failure in a number of circumstances that you wonder why you do it. As you look at the colony, you notice I branded it, and I also have my name and my phone number on there. That's required. This is to your benefit, not only to have it stamped or painted on there, but uh, we used to brand our hives. So we have a registered brand here. The reason, there are a lot of uh, people out there that steal beehives. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a serious offense. It's just like stealing cattle, horses. They've stolen your livestock and uh, you, you, you want it back. So um, branding or marking your hive is important. Do you have a little one to brand each of the bees too? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't tried that. It's a hanging offense. <laughs> Uh, those bee hinds are really small. <laughs> Chuck States is a biologist by trade, but his love for bees started in the family business. Jack's family was introduced to bees not long after they settled in Sings Canyon in the late 1800s. This was a horse ranch and cattle, and my grandfather accommodated some fellow apiary here. He was very much interested in those uh, bees, uh, just observing them here. So when he sold the ranch, or part of it, he chose to take up beekeeping. It wasn't much later that Jack's father joined the University of Wyoming's National Bee Laboratory. He joined just at a time when they were developing the treatment for a devastating bee disease, American fowl brood. My father, as a research assistant, worked on uh, bee diseases and, and beekeeping practices. Until he decided to quit and join the growing family bee business. Jack and his brother were brought into the trade early. We sold to family grocers. We were the largest independent packer of honey in, in the state of Wyoming for oh, close to 20 years. And when uh, the big uh, chain stores like Safeway came into existence, it put a lot of those small groceries out of business mm -hmm. and we couldn't supply the volume that was required by a larger uh, grocery chain. So uh, we had to make the decision to uh, get out of the business. Oh, but you could have sold to Sue B. But then you'd get that. Our, our good honey is going to be mixed in with all that <laughs> uh, inferior that's... honey. You see? Yeah. So today, Jack shares his knowledge and passion for bees with his ever-popular bee workshops. Basically, there's no opening to that hive at the top, so uh, it is not their responsibility to come out and sting somebody. So you can hold them. 
and you see how they've chew chewed the paper up and uh, that's a part of getting everything out of the hive that they don't want. They probably took pieces of that paper all the way down the hive and took it out the entrance because <laughs> they couldn't get it out this entrance. I just love to teach fifth and sixth graders. They're, they're the absolute best. Uh, their little minds are like sponges. They just pile in. They're just piling because we have them out of the hive. Okay. And eventually, they'll crawl all, all off the frame and just be hanging like a swarm off the hive because they've been disturbed. But remember, it's not their job to defend. No. And so they're just grouping together trying to communicate and probably have a big discussion of why, why the environment has changed. <laughs> and the behavioral biology is, really interests me a lot, especially the socialized uh, insects. Is they seem to lack that uh, uh, human-centric ethic, everything for themselves. They, they tend to uh, share. Some are more aggressive in a flower than others, and they'll push each other out. But there are no wars over this thing. There are other insects that are the war makers. And in fact, there are some varieties of wasps that are notorious uh, killers of, of honeybee colonies. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, the biggest problem with wasps are introduced European wasps. Uh, we call them vespid wasps. Mm -hmm. And when they go into a colony, they're, they're there to eat the larva of the honeybee. Mm -hmm. uh, the honeybees try to defend themselves and wasps can sting multiple times because there are no barbs on the stinger and they, they just inject it like a sewing machine needle. Uh, they're also strong and they'll often uh, come in and, and pull a honeybee apart. One of them will get on one leg and one on another and they just, uh, and this is a whole pile of uh, defense bees out there dead in front of the hive and, and you see those guys going, walking through almost with impunity and that's because honeybees are so uh, labor specialized that only s certain bees are defense bees. Certain bees uh, take care of the colony, clean and, and make wax and do this, and others are foragers. Mm -hmm. And once you can get past those defense bees, the others, it's not their job to defend the hive. So they can rob it. With, with no problem. It's actually what beekeepers do uh, when they want to rob the hive, is they go after those defender bees with smoke. Entering the colony, the place that the guard bees are gonna be are right there, so I'm gonna smoke them. It disrupts their communication amongst themselves, so they can't, they don't know how enough to organize against whatever attack it is. And once you can get past them, if, if you go in the middle of the colony, I can lay my hand directly on the surface of those bees and never get stuck. See, and they're not programmed to sting. See, they're not running out there and attacking me. And they nicely moved over. So uh, the secret is then if you want to take their honey, just get all those bees out of there that are the guard bees and, and just take it. Oh, and, and nobody will fight you for it. Oh. Eggs and brood. So she could be on this. Oh, there she is. Where is she? She's hiding. Oh, in that pile right there. Huh? Oh, there she is. Oh, there she is. There's the queen. Yeah. Does everybody see her? Yeah. Come on up and see her. Oh, yeah. Come around this side. Come you select side. Uh, uh, queens with certain genetic characteristics. We select the male drones with certain genetic characteristics and then we cross them and the, the resultant product of course is a fertilized queen that has the combination of those traits and you select for the traits just like in the livestock industry. Not only is a queen key to introducing improved genetics into a colony but she's also the behavioral nerve center of the hive. Every time you go into a colony and disturb it there is a collective memory of that disturbance. And if you repeat the disturbances over a period of time, gradually that library of experience results in increased awareness of the presence and the, and the situation of actually opening the hive. 
I call that, um, and others have called that, the red zone of defense. The bee in the hive that uh, is the collective library of this is the queen. Uh, she becomes very flighty, and, and uh, once you remove the uh, frame, she becomes very agitated and she'll release a pheromone, and that is an immediate clue for those bees to come and defend. So uh, uh, the cure for a, uh, an angry colony, if it's, it stays defensive, is to requeen. And it'll immediately calm them down because the queen's behavior, she has no library. She's new. And for the last seven years, beekeepers have been struggling. And colony collapse disorder has made pollinators like the honeybee, our canary in the coal mine. I knew it in, in the 40s. I think of what is concerned now is that loss, the disappearance of bees from the hive is, is uh, at a greater magnitude than it ever has been, and that's a great concern. Not all disappearances are attributed to colony collapse disorder. If bees don't like their uh, accommodation, they'll leave it. Uh, they'll, it won't be a swarm, it will just be, the queen stops laying, uh, she lightens her uh, body weight, and uh, they'll come and get her, and they'll all leave the hive. And create a new home. And create a new home. That's, yeah. that's called absconding. But this other is, is very puzzling and uh, a great concern to beekeepers. While no single cause has attained widespread acceptance, countless petitions for the ban of GMOs and various pesticides continue to circulate. And our industrialized monocrops seem to offer little relief. Probably the most common theory or the one that's getting the most you know, media right now is, is the pesticides, the neonicotinoids. Um, I certainly think that's a big contributing factor. Um, you know, some of the studies are showing that those bees can't navigate, they can't find their way home, and that you know, is certainly one of the things that they see in colony collapse disorder is a hive that's devoid of bees. It's not like you find a pile of dead bees in the hive. They're just gone, as if they went out and couldn't find their way home. Most recently, lab studies and a review of evidence have led the European Food Safety Authority to impose a ban on the use of some of these neonicotinoids across Europe. Our native bee populations aren't doing that much better. Xerces Society um, tracks a lot of the bumblebee species specifically, and they have several that are red listed on the brink of extinction. So our native bee populations aren't doing that much better. Oh, he's got a parasite on it. I can see it just under the corner of his wing. A white spot or a cream colored spot. I uh, see it right there, just mm -hmm. under the edge of his wing. I think that's a mite. A mite or something that's laid a parasitic egg on him. There are look-alike bumblebees that uh, lay their eggs on these bees oh. and uh, they parasitize them in the larval state. Hmm. So, ah, it's a, it's a tough world. Fortunately, perhaps, all this attention from CCD has brought about an explosion of hobby beekeepers, even in cities like Laramie. We probably have about 20 hives here in town, if I remember right. Beekeeping wasn't actually legal in Laramie for many years. There was just sort of a, a blanket statement in city ordinance that didn't allow you to keep bees in town. And so they, they got the ordinance changed so that people could have bees here in town. There's some drone bees. Though many of these hobby beekeepers are newcomers, they might offer an opportunity for alternative approaches to beekeeping and could help bolster genetic diversity. There's certainly a, a movement toward trying to keep things more natural um, and, and trying to maybe bolster the stock of the bee by not treating and, and sort of propping your bees up. You know, a lot of, a lot of beekeepers disagree with propping the bees up and, and, and promoting a weak bee, um, and they would maybe prefer to try to take a natural selection viewpoint. I think it's, you know, there's no perfect answer. If you're trying to make your living, you still have to try to, to keep that colony alive. That's an expensive thing for you to have um, if it fails. You know, I don't think that the hobby beekeeper is going to fix the problems that we have as an individual beekeeper, but I think it's important to try not to, you know, contribute to that problem with pesticides and things introduced into the hive, miticides and lots of treatments that are going to just 
help a weak bee succeed. It just doesn't seem productive to me. So as a hobbyist, at least. One of the honeybee's major afflictions is the varroa mite. And this is one area where genetic diversity appears to offer a solution. You can also see varroa mite, which is a little parasite that lives on the bee and passes diseases from colony to colony. That's probably the biggest thing that we're going to struggle with here in the U.S. because our bees didn't evolve in a coexisting position with that varroa mite. So the, the bee lab in Louisiana brought the, the Russian bees into the U.S. I think in 97 to try to provide beekeepers with a stock that could combat the varroa mite through hygienic behavior. The Russian bees um, actually co-evolved with that mite in their hives for the last 150 years. Um, what they do is they practice really, um, I won't say excessive, but really fastidious housekeeping practices. So if they sense that there's varroa in the comb, they'll clean that comb out. They might get rid of that brood. Um, they also groom themselves a lot. So if they find a varroa mite on their body or on their neighbor's body, they'll get rid of that mite. Um, so it's really just that hygienic behavior. There are two different hive designs in common use today. Most people probably start out with the traditional Langstroth hive, the, the stack of white boxes. Um, I opted to start out with a top bar hive, and I think that set me up with definitely some challenges in terms of how the bees build their honeycomb. Um, you have to keep things very level. And with the top bar hive, the girls take and attach the comb to the sides of the hive. In a typical Langstroth hive, there are four sides to the frame, so they only attach the comb to the frame. This is what so the frame looks like before the bees fill it out. We send our wax in and have it pressed in, into these uh, foundation cells. In a top bar hive, they just have this top bar to work with. This little stick of wood is all we provide them. So what they do to give that the support that it needs is they'll l attach the comb to the side of the hive with what they call brace comb in different spots. And so I have to free that up each time I go into the hive. We sort of have to keep them on the straight and narrow because they have less guidance inside the hive. They are more free form and allowed to build however they like. And so they're all festooned together and they're setting the level or finding plum to build a new comb. And so it's just a little chain of bees and they'll build a new comb inside that chain. So they have to use gravity. There's a simple design for how bees pack away the nutrients to raise their brood. So in a, in a Langstroth hive, the bottom box or bottom two boxes is the brood nest. And so that's where the bees are going to set up all their baby bees. And if you were to pull an individual frame from a Langstroth hive um, in the brood nest, the, there's like a rainbow shaped pattern um, close to the bottom of the frame. And they'll, they'll fill that with brood. And then they'll put a band of pollen around that, um, maybe an inch or inch and a half thick, right next to the brood. And then up in the corners and right across the top of the frame, they'll pu put honey storage on each frame so that it's very very close to the baby bees as they're going in and feeding that brood. Um, once you get outside the brood nest into the honey supers, then it's pretty much strictly honey. These open cells uh, are where they have removed uh, the honey or there's pollen in there. Oh. Um, in my top bar hive, the bees sort of sort that out for themselves. They'll take about seven or ten frames at the front of the hive and they'll set up their brood nest and they structure it exactly the same. So there's that rainbow pattern of brood and then the the pollen band and then the honey. And then once you get further to the back of the hive, they'll start honey storage. This is where the capping is. And in fact, mm. I can pull the honey out. See what it tastes like? Oh yeah. Mm. Mm, it's super sweet. I can't believe that's bee spit. It's something they spit out. They have a separate stomach. Oh. Never enters their digestive system mm -hmm. unless they eat it. Mm -hmm. So it's called the honey sack, mm. and uh, they have a, uh, the ability to transfer the nectar when it goes into the honey sack, and they'll put it out on their tongue and they'll fan their wings. Uh huh. It fans the water content out and makes nectar honey, oh. which is just co uh, concentrated sugar in a liquid system. Oh. We are we are really not allowed to sell honey at uh, a water content of, of more than 10 percent. Why is that? Uh, because then it's too much water uh, and it will ferment. And yeast will get oh, in it. Oh, so then you're Unless making you make someone need. need. Yeah. <laughs> so the honey is stored for feeding the baby bees and getting the colony through a long winter. Lots of waggle dance happening. So all these little girls that are shaking their rumps are doing the waggle dance. So there's pollen on this girl's legs right here. 
and if you'll watch, I think she'll waggle again here in a second. Waggle, waggle, and waggle, waggle. So she's telling the other girls where to find pollen. The pollen for the bee is the protein source. So um, their diet is, is sugars and proteins, much like ours. The sugar comes from the nectar. The, the protein comes from the pollen. And the adult bees aren't really interested in the pollen, but they feed it to the baby bees as they're growing up. They mix the pollen that they find in the field. It, it's attracted to their body by the electrical charge that's in their fur. And then they have to collect it all up with their legs. And as they groom, they mix it with a little bit of saliva in order to put it in their pollen baskets on their legs to get it home. Otherwise, it's too powdery to get home. Royal jelly is one of the more interesting products a colony produces. The, the bees secrete that from a gland in their head, and it's just a white jelly. It sort of looks like hand cream or lotion. It's very glossy, um, sort of translucent, white um, gel sort of substance. And they feed that to the baby bees for the first three or four days. Um, if they're going to make a queen bee, they feed that to her for the duration of her development. Not only does it convert the normal worker bee into a queen whose uh, 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 size and again uh, that of the worker, but she lives much, much longer. Average lifespan of a worker uh, in the summer is maybe three months. Uh, they'll live over a year and a half if they're not stressed, but queens can live eight years. Well, what is it in all of that? Uh, there are all kinds of nutrition in, in that uh, royal jelly, so we used to sell it. And of course, no hive can have, in uh, theory, two queens, because if they meet a uh, virgin and the, and the old queen, uh, they'll fight to the death. Their means of reproduction is to swarm. That is, one, one colony swarm becomes another through the production of of virgin queens who get mated and come back to the hive. When they raise the virgin queens, uh, they are doing so because the hive is so full of bees and honey and everything else, the queen cannot lay. She does not produce the hormone. And therefore they say, oh, we need to go get her last laid egg and raise it into a virgin queen. And they'll, and they'll do that They'll wait for it to almost hatch. By then, the, the old queen has reduced her weight because she's no longer laying. And she'll, uh, they'll come and get her and take her with them in the swarm to establish a, a new organism mm -hmm. out there. Hopefully then the bees that are left behind are able to take care of the virgin when she comes back and they'll start up their own colony. Beekeepers seem to enjoy clever experimentation. Renee and her husband took on a novel project recently. Um, my husband, who's not the beekeeper in the family, was tasting the pollen just out of curiosity. And he's a brewer, he's a, an avid home brewer, and he wanted to know, he, he was kind of curious whether the pollen would be like a hop additive to add bitterness to the beer. The yellow stuff that you can see is actually the part of the hop that you're after, which is essentially the pollen from the hop. And you can smell the nice, strong, hoppy aroma. And if it's fresh hops and you roll it in your hand, um, it's kind of a good test to tell if they're dry enough and ready to pick. And that's what's actually flavoring the beer. The leaves are just, you know, carrying the pollen. And that just sort of started it. We collected a little bit of pollen um, just to see what would happen if he added it to a beer, what, what sort of flavor it would have. Um, knowing a little bit more about it, I wondered if there were some natural yeasts inside that pollen that we might be able to catch um, and use. Um, again, it was going to be a complete experiment because we didn't know what that yeast was going to impart in terms of flavor. Um, so we collected some pollen and we put it in a starter of, of some malt um, water. So it had some sugar to eat um, and it fermented a bit. So we you know, raised up some of that yeast in a, in a culture on the, on the counter in the kitchen with a stir plate. Mm -hmm. And then he did a blend of three of, different... Yeah, three different grains to provide the, the, about 60% of the sugar for the batch. And then 40% uh, of the sugar that will be fermented into alcohol was presented by way of honey. So, <clears throat> so you made, he, he made a three gallon batch. Right. How much honey went into that? Just shy of three pounds. Oh, and so. this is about a pound? It's about a pound and a half. Pound and a half? Yep. Oh, it's pretty good dose. Pretty good dose of honey. <laughs> How much of the pollen stuff? We only collected, you know, a handful of the pollen um, for the purposes of the experiment. So it was maybe a couple of ounces. It's a really light color. It was almost complete conversion. So it's probably a fairly big beer.
That is really good. And I have to admit, I wouldn't drink That's a beer, but I would drink this. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't like hops. That's I don't like that. Mm -hmm. a, yeah, if we had a bunch of pollen. Uh, yeah. Had my own brewer. Yeah. We took it to the homebrew meeting a couple weeks ago um, and let all the guys try it. We told them what we'd done. And they, you know, some of the guys looked a little bit intrepid, you know. And, um, but they all tried it and they were like, ooh, they're like, we can drink a lot of that. So it actually turned out really good for an experiment at a three gallon batch, you know, with, uh, I don't know what the grain bill was. It's fairly light grain, but um, he got almost complete fermentation out of it. So there wasn't any sugar left. That's why it's nice and dry. Um, and it was three pounds of, two and a half or three pounds of honey. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty good, pretty good conversion. So it should be fairly big. So have you thought of a name for this? He's calling it Half Breed's Last Hurrah because that's the hive that died. Oh. And so he, it's their last hurrah, their last contribution to the food chain is their, is their beer. <laughs> so, kind of a little bit, that's what he thought. A story very good, that, well, the end of the colony. <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool that they would ship you a box of bees and the fact that you could get a three pound package of bees in the mail I thought was fascinating. I was signed up. I wanted to see that happen. I want to see them come in the mail. <laughs> We're quite a crazy bunch as I've come to find out across <laughs> the beekeeping community. But you have to have sort of the personality, uh, you know, that's compatible with keeping bees because it's, it's quite a challenge.